down to the last two, and you can see they're both side by side because we're talking about a new era in the management of type 2 diabetes and is cardio and renal protection at long last a reality. This is an exciting area. We've heard a bit about this at the meeting, but um, I make no apology because I think this is, these are game changers, these drugs, and um, we need to have the most up-to-date information we can. And the first, uh, the case for GLP-1 analogs will be given by a really a world authority here, uh, Jean Jules Holst from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Thanks for coming. And uh, we look forward to hearing what y you have to say in the case for GLP-1 analogs. So thank you very much for asking me to come here and talk about GLP-1 and uh, cardio and renal protection. Uh, there's only be a few slides about renal protection because there isn't a lot of information there. But um, of course, there's a little bit more about the other stuff. Um, so does this advance? What way? Yeah, good. So what are the what are the the GLP-1 analogs? So and this is a little bit important. Uh, we have these short-acting ones that are based on on really the extended four molecule and. Um, I will dismiss them right away because they are short acting. They are only there for a few hours during the day and they do not have a chance to show what they really can. So it's a bad way of, of using these drugs. And then there are the other ones, of course, there's the GLP-1 here itself. And um, there are some long acting ones that have been long acting in various ways. And uh, let me say right away that uh, we don't have any data for dulaglutide here. Uh, albiglutide is probably running out of the field, I think. Uh, exenatide here uh, is unfortunately dosed in a slightly too low dose to be competitive with the others. And that's the main problem with that compound. And so I'm not going to say a lot about it. Um, so then what is left really is the raclutide over there, which is a long acting one, and uh, semaclutide, which has also just entered the field and where we do have some data. So um, this is the uh, what happened to the uh, cardiovascular outcome trials with the DPP-4 inhibitors. I just mentioned this because they did not do any harm, but they were pretty neutral. It's a little bit of a question with saxagliptin, but we can discuss that at, at another time. But let's go on to the studies we do have with uh, the GLP-1 agonist, and here's the elixir trial. There was no effect, but as I said, uh, this was a short-acting, uh, extendin-derived stuff and it also these patients were desperately ill so probably it wouldn't be possible to show anything in that trial anyway. And we have the Excel trial down here. They just missed, as you can see, the significance here in their risk reduction. But again, the dose is too low, so that probably explains most of it. So we're left with those two studies, the LIDA and the sustained six trials that both have significant improvements in cardiovascular risk. So um, this is from the LIDA study, which was the big study with erucleotide. And uh, one thing that was obvious here was cardiovascular death reduction and their relative risk here by 22%, which is quite uh, remarkable. So what can, we, what can we say about that? How is that possible? Can it do that? And uh, usually when I talk about the heart and TLP1, I talk about four different ways that you can influence this that have been brought up during the last 10 or 15 years myocardial performance and non-ischemic heart failure, myocardial survival in ischemic heart disease, endothelial dysfunction in type 2, and uh, decrease, decrease of cardiovascular risk uh, markers in type 2. But, so let's have a look at the first one. And uh, here, if we, go, if we, if we dive into um, the, uh, out, the subgroup analysis of the LIDA study here and look at chronic heart failure uh, here, then you can see that if you have chronic heart failure, it doesn't really do a thing. But if you don't have heart failure, it works. This is a, a crude way of analyzing these data. But you know, we, we, we're looking for ways to understand what goes on here. So these are the actual data, and this is now what happens to the people during the therapy. Does it increase or decrease um, the risk of heart failure? And there was a non-significant decrease during the therapy. That's nice but it was non-significant and you can't make any conclusions. So there are two studies out there that, have, that are dedicated to look at the effects of liraglutide in heart failure. And this is the one study, FIGHT, and unfortunately the data went the wrong way, as you can see here. And there's another one actually, the LIVE study, and it was not so lively after all, because uh, there was no change in the ejection fraction in these uh, rather large groups here. 
uh, what they found was an increase, as everybody knows, in heart rate, and they thought that perhaps this was not a very good thing because they also had an, an apparent increase in serious cardiac events on those on the neuroglutide, less in those on placebo. Could that be associated with the tachycardia? Because we have tachycardia. So that's interesting. Tachycardia in GLP-1 is interesting. That's one of the effects that you can kind of talk about. And that is because if you look, at, look for the receptors for GLP-1 in the heart, one of the places where this has been reported to be present is right here in the sinoatrial node. And we'll come back to uh, other possible locations in the heart in a minute. Uh, the leader study, what happened to heart rate? Yes, there was an increase, as you can see here. Uh, if we increase the dose of liraglutide up to three milligrams in the scale study here, then you can see that there's a little bit further increase in heart rate, so it really does this. This is the problem. It goes away once you stop the therapy. So this is an effect of the compound. So where is this? receptor. So this is the very recent study from uh, our colleagues in Toronto, from Dan Drucker, where they really have done a lot of work to try to nail it down. And they did find a lot of mRNA transcripts in all four chambers from 15, at least human hearts. And the levels are approximating those detected in the human pancreas, which is very surprising. All four chambers. There was no GLP-2 receptor expression. Hmm, interesting. And have a look at this. There was no glucagon receptor. And that fits with the idea that perhaps glucagon is in interacting with the GLP-1 receptor, because it does. And so, I mean, as a young, as a young doctor, I did. I injected the people with, with heart problems with glucagon to try to help them. But apparently, I was doing a GLP-1 trick already then. <laughs> so um, uh, they were not found in cardiac fibroblasts, coronary uh, artery endothelial, of vascular smooth muscle cells. They did find some in the sinoatrial node. So they couldn't find them. So where they sit, in, in spite of the fact that there is a, a sizable expression, they couldn't find them by any way. So we simply don't know where they sit. That's the status. At any rate, that was the heart rate. And we were discussing whether heart failure was something you could do with a GLP-1 agonist. No. Then let's have a look at, 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 at ischemia. <clears throat> so what happened to myocardial infarction and leader? And you can see that there is a nice reduction, but it's just not significant. But it, it was there. It was there. It, it looks good, doesn't it? And uh, if you go to sustained 6 with semaglutide, the difference is actually even bigger, as you can see here. Very convincing. But this study is smaller. It is shorter. It's two years and in half or about a third of the number of patients. So this was a pre-market uh, uh, pre study. Um, so that perhaps explains the missing significance. So there's something about it, perhaps. And if you look at leader again, so what did drive the change in cardiovascular deaths that I told you? So there was something about myocardial infarction. There was something about non-fatal stroke. But none of these were significant, so we're still left with not a really good explanation for this remarkable effect. Uh, if we look at the remaining uh, results from the sustained 6 with semaglutide, so up here you have the primary outcome, very nice reduction in the combined mace. Here you have the non-fatal stroke. This was significant. Wow. This was the non-fatal myocardial infarction. I showed you that already. And here comes the surprise. There was no effect on cardiovascular death. No effect at all. I've been looking at this graph and looking and looking and looking and trying to find out what that means. Because as you remember, I just showed you a rather big and very significant effect of liraglutide on cardiovascular deaths. So <clears throat> I have to look at it again. So for the first 12 uh, months here, perhaps uh, you couldn't expect to find anything. And now recall that the semaglutide sustained study is a two-year study. It, at two years, they are certainly diverging here. But again, we only have about a third or something like that of the patients in this study. So maybe that is the explanation. It's still something I will be looking out for, because it is a little bit strange, I think, that it didn't at all appear. Um, <clears throat> 
There's another thing that I find extremely interesting in the sustained six study with semaglutide, that is the reduction in revascularization, which was highly significant and 35%. That, I think, is interesting. Why does that occur? So what could be the reasons for some of these changes that we see, all of the things that are now have brought forward? So of course, these uh, compounds, they work on blood glucose. These are the A1Cs in liter. And this is actually a very nice graph that shows that you, when you treat people with dragotide, you'll keep their A1C down, and you do that actually for five years. So this is the best data to show the duration of action of dragotide. It's good. Well, but this was a blinded study, and the placebo group was supposed to have the same glucose. They were supposed to be equipoise. They didn't make it, of course. They couldn't, because the dragotide was too good. But they did what they could at the various... Uh, institutions where they did the study. So they dialed up for metformin and sulfonylureas and everything they had, and in particular, insulin. So there is a difference between those two groups. One group is having a lot more anti-diabetic medicine than the other, apart from uracotide. And hypo, hypos. So we just heard a beautiful lecture about hypoglycemia. So here we have it. So there's a very nice reduction in confirmed and severe hypoglycemia with liraglutide in these studies. Could that be the explanation? So, of course, uh, the company has put all their statisticians to find out about this, and if you can understand what they say, they say no, but they say no all the time, so you never know. Um, in, in the study with semaglutide, you also have very, mar very marked effects on, uh, on glycated hemoglobin here, and also on body weight. So here we have some sizable factors that could influence these results. And here, again, uh, with semaglutide, a very remarkable effect on blood pressure, systolic blood pressure in these studies over these two years. So now we have some very good markers, risk markers, and that's the fourth parameter we were talking about that could influence these results. Now, just a few words about the kidneys. That's one of the places where we do have GLP-1 receptors and where we know where they sit. Isn't that nice? Because they sit in the afferent arterioles, and there are many of them. But exactly what they do in humans in those arterioles, we don't know. So uh, let me just show you uh, what happened in these trials. There was a very nice reduction in the time to first renal event and the first renal event was macroalbuminuria, doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage renal disease or renal death. So very nice in DIDA and significant, as you can see. And the same is true with semaglutide, uh, even stronger <laughs> reduction in the time to the first event. So, so something happens. And we do have the receptors in the, in the kidneys, but we don't really know what they do. Here is one of the attempts to find out what it is. It was a study we did some years ago, 2016 here, where uh, we were looking at liraglutide in patients with type 2 using creatinine clearance uh, for, and, and uh, renal blood flow measurements, tissue perfusion, and oxygenation. That could be done, all of it. So um, there was no real effect on, on GFR, and that has not been seen in any of these human studies, or renal blood flow, and no change in local renal blood perfusion or oxygenation. Lithium excretion increased by, increased by 14%, and sodium clearance tended to increase. That's what you observe normally. Uh, influences on blood pressure, yes, but these are acute studies. So here you have increases in blood pressure, and they are associated with an increase in pulse rate. <clears throat> and you too decreased by 21%. No other effects on the other components, metanephrines or excretion of catecholamines. But this is interesting. So the conclusion was that, that liraglutide did not affect renal hemodynamics, but decreased the proximal tubular sodium reabsorption. Blood pressure increased with short-term as opposed to long-term treatment. That's nothing about this GLP-1 A and P axis. That is uh, something that was invented in mice. Uh, and your two levels decreased, which may contribute to the renal protection by the GLP-1 receptor agonists. That's what I can offer about the kidneys. So what I have been trying to say is that the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the rapatide and semaglutide, they improve MACE in the cardiovascular outcome trials. They have no effect on the failing heart. 
Their effect on cardiac ischemia is uncertain, but probably it may be there. The main direct effect on the heart is to increase heart rate. There's no effect and no receptor on coronary vessels. They prevent stroke, myocardial infarction, and reduce revascularization, and this is particularly true for semaglutide. Probably a question of how powerful, how potent you use this therapy. Beneficial effects on A1C, body weight, and blood pressure. Together, their actions improve metabolic health. Their CV action may be preventive. So what my proposal is, and the take-home message of what I'm trying to say is, I don't think you can, you can treat cardiac events with a GLP-1 agonist, but you may be able to prevent it from occurring. Thank you.